So without further ado, please welcome our first guest speaker at Cultures of Digital's first ever conference, Kerry Cole, a marketing strategist with Green Emerald Marketing, who's going to talk about putting content strategy into the heart of web projects. Um, so, um, I'm Kerry. I, uh, my background is that I have worked for charities and non-profits for over 15 years, uh, really from a marketing perspective. So I've gone into organisations who have not really had any experience uh, or anybody working within a marketing team um, and started with a blank sheet of paper and helped them make sure that their organisation um, is really putting marketing at the core of their business or their fundraising efforts, or their advocacy efforts, a whole raft of things. Um, as part of that, and I'll come on to this a bit later on, um, I, I don't really class myself as a content strategist in a conventional sense, there's plenty of them out there. Um, I kind of class myself as an undercover content strategist. I don't do it as my day job, but I find that actually when I go into organisations, people aren't thinking about content um, as an asset and I end up trying to convince them that they should do. Uh, so Seth Godin, uh, marketing guru, uh, I read a lot of his stuff, his blogs are pretty good, uh, pretty amazing actually, and I have been um, following this particular quote, well ever since I got into marketing. So marketing is not an emergency, it's a planned, thoughtful exercise that started a long time ago and doesn't end until you're done. And I think content should be treated in exactly the same way. Um, it shouldn't be treated as an emergency. It should be planned and thought about, and it doesn't stop when you deliver the web project or the product, the new product, exciting product that you've launched. It doesn't stop then, actually, really. It continues and carries on. So I'm going to share a few things with you today. One, the problems that I've encountered uh, with content. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of what content strategy is as a discipline and hopefully give you some quick wins that you can take away and start to use and develop uh, within your own organisations. Aha, right. So I think the poll is ready. So the first question is, what is content? Anything displayed on the web, text, media, oh, there's a few video in there, website, information, assets for marketing, data, a bit small on there, but it's on there, excellent. Okay, it's all of these things, and actually a whole heap more. In, well, again, in my opinion, <laughs> I should add. So, it is text, it is data, it's audio, it's your podcasts, it's your video content, it's animations, it's photographs, graphics, images, it's user comments, it's polls that you generate, it's games, it's surveys, it's everything. In terms of content, actually it's not just limited to text and data, it's everything that you produce and put out there um, is all defined as content. Okay, so the next question that I've put up is, who's responsible for content in your organisation? I'll give you a few seconds. Big wavy. Everyone. <laughs> okay. I love that. That's brilliant. Yes, you're right, actually. Everyone's responsible for content in an organisation because actually you're the guys looking at your content on a daily basis. You may not be responsible for it in terms of its final delivery, but actually you're just, just as responsible as everybody else within your organisation to make sure that it's fit for purpose and it suits the needs of need. Um, I'm a little bit worried about the not me, thank goodness, if I'm honest. And the worst one on this list, I'll be honest, is committee because any content that is created by committee never goes anywhere. <coughs> it sits in spreadsheets or Word documents or Trello or whatever, whatever project management system you use, if content is designed by committee, 
it goes absolutely nowhere. Right, got a bit too excited. <coughs> next problem is content isn't seen as an asset within organisations and I kind of turn my hair out at this one if I'm honest, particularly when I'm working with organisations that really rely on their websites or their online products to deliver a service um, or to deliver really pertinent information. Actually the content created and put on those uh, sites just aren't seen as an asset. And Christina Halverson, who um, is really a content strategist, uh, she, uh, she's a content strategy guru. I heard her speak back in 2010, and that really took me on my journey with content strategy. Um, she gets it right first time, which is, unless we commit to treating content as a critical asset worthy of strategic planning and meaningful investment, we'll continue to churn out worthless content in reaction to unmeasured requests. And I'm sure there's plenty of you here today that actually get somebody come into the office one day and go, I've he heard of this really great new thing, we should really do something on the website. Or, I really forgot, I completely forgot about this event and actually now what we need to do is create all of this content really quickly and get it up on the website and market it. It's not seen as an asset. Fourth problem, redesign projects. Now this is my biggest bugbear. So um, I've shared with you here is a um, project plan from a website, uh, or actually it was a platform that I was on the project team for, that we outsourced to an agency. Um, and they delivered the project plan to us, all nice and shiny, and said, here we go, this is, this is the process we're gonna follow. Can anyone see where content is? It's in the deployment phase. So it's not discussed at all in the requirements gathering stage. It was all about the wireframes and the design, and it was all about uh, making sure that the Gantt chart was followed. They were so focused on the delivery, they forgot about the assets that were really important to the project. So, me being the critical friend, as I like to call myself, I stuck my hand up and said, um, we don't wanna do content at phase three. What if it doesn't fit in with the wireframe? What if actually we don't have enough content because we haven't thought about particular sections of the website? <coughs> um, so I managed to convince everybody on the team that actually we should be looking at content in all four phases of this particular project. It took a while, but we got there in the end. And finally, content is hard. It's hard to manage, it's hard to advocate for, it's hard to get people to realise that it is really an asset. And I love this picture of Sisyphus Cat, and I try and get it in any presentation that I ever do. It just really is, it is, it's tough, and you always have to be working on it. Okay, so content strategy, what is it? Well, I'll be quite honest with you and say I'm not <coughs> really going to spend a lot of time talking about what it actually is. Um, I'm going to suggest that you actually buy this book by Christina Halverson, Content Strategy for the Web. It's absolutely amazing. If you can get to speak to her or any other content strategists, um, I suggest you do so, um, mainly because everything you really need to know, it's, it's already out there, and I've only got half an hour for the talk, so I can't really spend a lot of time on it. Um, there's, going back to the content is hard. Actually, defining content strategy is just as difficult and Christina and her team at Brain Traffic came up with three definitions. Um, I follow um, content strategy means getting the right content to the right people in the right place at the right time, really because I come from a marketing background and for me it is all about the audience, always has been, always will be. So this definition fits my, um, fits how my thinking. Okay, so what is content strategy? So back in 2010, when I uh, heard Christina talk, read her book, and started to take everything in from a content strategy perspective, the um, core strategy diagram on your left um, was pretty much what I followed up until about six months ago. Um, and what I loved about the core strategy was the real focus not only around the user, but also around the workflow. So going back to my comment about creating content by committee. Actually, you don't need to if you've got a decent workflow in place. And governance, making sure that actually you always um, are treating content as an asset 
and that you've got that governance of reviewing, refreshing, refining all the time. Then in, 2000, in 2017, um, the Government Digital Service here in the good old UK um, decided that they wanted to completely revamp gov.uk. Um, and the Government Design Service brought in um, a lady called Sarah Richards, um, and she came up with a new concept called content design, which put users at the forefront of anything that the gov.uk website was going to create and deliver. Um, so Christina Halverson and her team at Brain Traffic caught on to this idea and last year came up with the content strategy quad. So uh, the difference here being that actually instead of thinking about the structure and the substance, uh, sorry, the governance and structure came together and more uh, focus was um, fixed on the editorial and the user experience. So who's the audience? What do they want? What are they doing when they go to the website? And what is their experience when they get there? Um, I've only been using this quad for about six months or so. Um, I do like it. I'm still a bit wedded to the old one, if I'm honest, but change, uh, you know, change is hard. And eventually, I think a lot of people will move over to the new quad when they're working with content. Okay, so, quick wins. Am I okay for time? Yeah. Um, so, I'm conscious that you guys need to go away and if you want to advocate for content strategy, then I need to share with you some quick wins on what you can do when you go back to your offices, desks, clients. So, here's some that I know that work. Um, do a high-level review. So, ask yourself, your stakeholders, your colleagues, Really ask your users, even if you only ask one or two. Ask them, is the content on the website relevant? Is the content packaged in the right way? So if there's a whole heap of text, actually, should it be a video? Should it be a podcast? It doesn't have to be text at the end of the day. And the best question that you can ask, and if somebody is really committed to the work that, um, that they're doing within the organisation, or if you've got a user who really, really values the information or the content or the service that you provide, ask them what part of that content or website drives them mad. And if you get the right person, they'll chew your ear off, I'm telling you now. Um, they will be really open and honest with you and you'll learn a huge amount about what works and what doesn't work. Um, identify changes that are achievable to you, fix them, just go away and do it. Um, now, what I would also advocate that you do, in addition to identifying those quick wins, or those quick fixes, is in the background do a content audit. Now, this will take you some time, it, you will tear your hair out, it will frustrate you, you might cry, uh, all, all the feelings will come out. Um, so, this was the last content audit that I did uh, when I was working at the Royal Association for Deaf People here in Colchester. Um, it took weeks to do this. I handed it off to a colleague, turned her into an undercover content strategist as a result. Um, and I was told when I joined the organisation, oh, our website's really easy. We've only got about 100 pages. It's really easy to manage, update, and all the content's really relevant. So we did the content audit. Here's the result of the content audit in paper form. There was over 330 pages on this website. The senior stakeholders in the organisation had no idea just how large and unmanageable their website was until we did the content audit. And of those 330 pages, we gave them a RAG status, which is not on here, but is on here. So if you've got really good eyesight, you can see the colours. Um, of those 330 pages, 43 of them needed to come down immediately. And, all, and of the rest of them, 51 were classed as amber and needed updating pretty quickly. Um, now, if I'd have sent this as an email to the senior stakeholders, they would have ignored it. I printed it off with the RAG status, and actually everybody in, around that table gasped and couldn't believe that their website had got so out of control in a very short space of time. 
So I highly recommend that you do this and you print off the physical copy to show people because it really does make a difference. They won't open a spreadsheet. They really won't. Um, competitor websites. Um, I kind of take this, you should take this as a bit of a cautionary tale potentially. Um, competitor websites um, are a good mine of information, but you shouldn't just be following. You should always be leading when it comes to any digital work that you're doing. But actually, it can help you make some considered decisions, um, particularly around how content is organised, what type of content they're using. So um, again, you know, if your if your <coughs> website is very text heavy and they're using uh, video or animations to get their point across. Um, you may want to think about actually how that can work for you. Use of language, I'll come back to this, but actually language is really important. If you are um, using jargon or using words on your website that is internalised, so you're writing it for yourselves, your users will have no idea what you're talking about. And actually if your competitors are really good at talking in plain language or using phrases that your users know and understand, then you should really be thinking about how you're talking to your users. So again, cautionary tale, don't react, make considered decisions, but I do think that it's still worth looking at. Analytics. So, um, have a look at them. What are you measuring? Are you measuring the right things, do you think? Are you measuring things that actually you think you should be measuring, but you're not using the data? Um, are the most visited pages the ones you thought they would be? Maybe in your mind you've got an idea of what that might look like, but actually the stats tell you something else. Uh, going back to use of language, what are the top keyword searches? Are users using words that you are not using in your website or on your product? Um, if you've had a chance to do the high level review and made some changes, have a look at what impact they've made. Um, Analytics obviously provide huge amounts of data. I would ask the question, is it useful? All the time, whether you're working with content or any other, um, any other stats, always ask the question around data, is it useful? Okay, um, so communication. Share your findings uh, with the people that you've been talking to, with your users and your stakeholders. Share what you've learned. Uh, make yourself available to anybody who wants to talk to you about content. Um, I usually find that coffee and cake helps with that a lot. If you, offer, if you offer the opportunity to go out and have coffee and cake and chat about all things content, most people are very open to that. Um, and listen, don't provide your opinions on what you think um, should happen with your content. Listen to actually what, the, what those people that you're talking to have to say because you'll be surprised at how much information that they're willing, one, willing to share, and two, that you'd never thought about because you haven't put yourself in their position. Okay, finally, advocate. So, start with quick wins. Um, so I've given you a few ideas there for you to take away. I would certainly start there <coughs> and then follow up with um, Christina's book. Um, recruit undercover content strategists. So um, in the, oh, crikey, 18 years now, <laughs> um, no, no, I've got that wrong entirely. So 2010 when I started looking at content strategy, I've managed to recruit two undercover content strategists. One of them now <coughs> works at Citizens Advice as a content designer, and one of them is now at Bernardo's championing content all the time while she works within the fundraising team. Um, Champion content all the time. So not just at the beginning of the project. Um, a lot of um, people that I come across think, well, we need the content first. Before we do anything else, we need the content. Um, or, like I've shown you with that uh, web design project, actually they didn't think of content till the deployment stage. Actually, you should be thinking about it all the time, in my opinion and you, the mindset should be content always. It's the first thing the user needs to know. You know, they want information, they want to use their, ser they want to use your service. It really is all about the content that you're delivering. And keep learning. So this is my plug really uh, for Colchester Digital. I, I started coming along, I think about 18 months or so ago. I go to pretty much every meetup 
mainly because if I come away learning one thing that can help me, then it's been worth the two hours of my time. Um, but also get out there, look at, read blogs on content strategy, link up with content strategists, ask questions, read. Um, out of all the books that I have on my bookshelves, these are the ones that I go back to all the time. And I would highly recommend, in addition to Christina's book, um, switch how to change things when change is hard. Because I can guarantee if people in your organisation or your clients aren't thinking about content as being an asset, it's hard to change their minds. And you've got to get really, really good at convincing them that, um, that content is an asset and it is worth spending the time on. Okay, and just to finish off, uh, good old Steve Jobs. So, uh, he's quoted as saying, uh, in my career I found that the best people are the ones that really understand the content, and they're a pain in the butt to manage. I am. Um, but you put up with it because they produce great content, and that's what makes great products. It's not process, it's content. Now, the million dollar question is, did anyone pop a question on Slido? Let's have a look. Nope, so that's all right. So I've got away with no questions. Carry on. Thanks very much. Um, I can take one. Yeah, we've got five minutes. If anyone would like to ask any questions. Oh, that is way outside of my brief, other than it goes back to it goes back to how well written the content is in the first place, if I'm honest. Um, so, oh, crikey, yeah, that's quite a question. I would, yeah, focus on the content from the very beginning, looking at those keyword searches, making sure that actually um, what content needs to be delivered via the chatbot will, in effect, deliver what the user needs. Um, and I would go back to, to, to the very beginning around that content strategy and build a content strategy around um, the chatbot functionality and what, what you think your users might ask, but also going out to those users in the first place and asking that question, if you were to use a chatbot for this product or this service, what, what are your needs? What are you looking for in terms of your answers? And build the content strategy around that. Thanks very much. Oh, yeah. So, um, you showed that project plan, and I think probably a lot of people can identify. Yep. <laughs> shall I? Um, let's pop that back up and all weep, shall we? <laughs> I think, um, in, my, in my experience, like what, what stops that changing for a lot of people is that if you if you try to begin with content, then people worry that it's just going to stall everything. Yeah. And you can't deliver this when you you wait and you can't do it in six months. Have you found then? Fall in, yes, and back to committee, which is a scary place. Well, this project's a really good example, actually, um, of by convincing uh, everybody on the project board that actually we needed to bring the content forward to the beginning, um, but also, well, prioritising that content, not only to come at the beginning, but to come through the whole process. So, um, so we were, when we were looking at the wireframes, we were thinking about content and putting physical content that we wanted to use into those wireframes. Did it work? Did it work the way we thought it might work? Um, so yes, it kind of does hold up the project, but I do feel that, that by having those conversations in the beginning and not so much making allowances for it, but saying, actually, we need to extend the project from the very beginning, it's, you know, we need to, to bear in mind that actually there does need to be some toing and froing around um, whether this content fits, whether it works, whether it's um, on, whether it fits our tone of voice and it's what we want to be saying in the future. Um, I do think that 
you know, you you pretty much in every single block on this um, on this on this particular project, we were always talking about content, and we did move the the boundaries for the for the delivery. Um, but in the end, what we delivered um, wasn't delivered half-heartedly or as a minimum viable product. It went live. Um, it didn't go. It wasn't delivered late. Um, and it delivered what we wanted it to deliver because we had those conversations at the very beginning and made those allowances at the very beginning. And you do have to have really, really open and honest conversations and you have to say that it's hard and you have to say that it's going to take more time. But actually, what you're not doing at phase three in deployment is every man, within the, every man woman and child within the organisation is not frantically writing content till three in the morning and then trying to make it fit into the product that's been developed. So that's how you win them over, is say, actually, at this point, this is the reality, this is what's going to happen. If you wait till deployment, we will get no sleep, we will be living on coffee, we will be delivering a minimum viable product because it's just not going to be fit for purpose. And that's how you try and change that mindset. Okay. Brilliant. Can we just carry a big, big...